I invite you to turn with me to the first book in the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 23. You find it on page 1053 if you're using a pew Bible. If you're a guest with us, we've been studying through the Gospel of Matthew, and we've come to the end of Matthew chapter 23, an important and uh, transitional passage of Scripture in the Gospel. And we're going to begin reading in verse 34 of Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23, beginning in verse 34, and this is what the Word of God says. Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In their book, The Genius of Israel, Dan Senor and Saul Singer seek to find the secret of Israel's resilience in the face of its overwhelming external and internal challenges. And while the book provides a fascinating look into Israeli society, to the Christian who is familiar with God's promises to his people, Senor and Singer's work should not be that astonishing. For since the call of Abraham, the Jews have been God's chosen people. And throughout the centuries, the Jewish people's resilience has been on full display, even in seasons of immense suffering, unrelenting oppression, and undeniable attempts to exterminate them. And through it all, God has continued to preserve his promised people. And although they have been scattered to every part of the world, have become citizens in countless different countries, have intermarried with Gentiles, and even have differing opinions among themselves as to what makes a real Jew, they continue as a distinct people. The preservation and prosperity of the Jewish people should be an encouragement to us. Because since he made his covenant with Abraham some 4,000 years ago, God has pledged to preserve his chosen people and to one day permanently call them back to himself. But many ask, if they are God's chosen people, then why all of the suffering? Why all of the conflict that we're seeing on our, our TV screens? Why has all of the evils of the world been repeatedly unleashed upon his chosen people? Well, in addition to God's sovereign discipline and plan over his chosen people, as one commentator stated, it is Satan's desire to eliminate them because they are specially beloved by God and because to destroy them would be to frustrate God's promise of bringing them back to himself and giving them to Christ as his inheritance. Now in the conclusion to Jesus' final public message here in Matthew chapter 23, his sobering words to the scribes and the Pharisees and to all of Israel reveal both the imminent and inevitable judgment 
that would soon take place upon them and the promise of their ultimate reconciliation to God. You will notice in the text that Jesus' final words provide a stark contrast between the sovereignty of God with the word I used four times throughout this passage and the responsibility of man with the word you used ten times in this passage. And Jesus' final message was a message for the generation of his day. And friends, it is a message for the generation of our day. So would you notice with me, first of all, in verses 34 to 36, Christ's condemnation. He says, beginning in verse 34, Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. And you'll notice how Jesus begins in verse 34. He begins with the word therefore, which is a transitional word. And in this particular instance, this is a significant transition that takes place in the text. And the therefore, I believe, refers back to the first 33 verses of this chapter where Jesus has illuminated the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees and where he has pronounced eight woes of judgment upon them. And Jesus is saying because of their hypocrisy and because of the judgment that has come upon them and their inability to escape being sentenced to hell, he says that as a form of further condemnation and judgment, he is going to send to them, in verse 34, prophets and wise men and scribes. He moves in this verse from the past to the future. And he uses Old Testament language that the scribes and the Pharisees certainly would have recognized and been familiar with. And he shows them that he is sending his disciples to them in the same role as the Old Testament prophets and wise men and scribes. And you'll notice in verse 34 that according to Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees will kill and crucify some of these servants. Others they will flog in the synagogues. And still others they will persecute from town to town. And when you read and study the book of Acts, you see all of Jesus' prophetic words in this verse fulfilled. And according to tradition, in church history, tradition says that the apostle Peter was crucified upside down because he did not want to be recognized in the same type of crucifixion as the Lord Jesus Christ because he didn't feel that he was worthy. The book of Acts teaches us that Stephen was stoned. And church history says that James was put to death by the sword. And even though uh, he persecuted Christians from town to town, once the apostle Paul became a believer, he became the recipient of persecution. And he testified in the book of 2 Corinthians that five times at the hands of the Jews... He received 39 lashes, that three times he was beaten with rods, and once he was stoned. If you continue to study the life of the Apostle Paul, you'll find that he was opposed and frequently driven out of many cities, including Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Thessalonica, Berea, Corinth, Jerusalem, and Caesarea. And through all of his words of confrontation and condemnation to the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus is illustrating the climax of these religious leaders' rebellion as they not only reject him, 
But they also reject and kill and crucify and persecute those he sends to them on his behalf. Moreover, if you'll look in verse 35, Jesus says a very interesting phrase about this. He says that he is sending these servants to the religious leaders so that on the scribes and the Pharisees may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. Now you'll notice Jesus didn't say all the blood shed on the earth. Look at the text. He said all of the righteous blood shed on the earth. And what he's referring to there is innocent blood. And when in Hebrew it says that blood comes upon someone, it literally means that someone becomes guilty of murder and they should be punished with divine retribution. And so Jesus is saying, if you will look at the text carefully, that he is sending his disciples to the religious leaders and to Israel to fulfill the climax of their judgment from him so that they would be found guilty of shedding innocent blood and come under divine retribution and judgment. In other words, friends, it was fully within God's purpose that these wicked leaders of Israel along with all the other Jews who rejected Christ, have the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on the earth placed upon them for judgment. Now, it wasn't that God desired these men to reject His grace and be condemned, but it was that when they persisted in rejecting Him, He brought divine judgment and poured His wrath out upon them. And as they continued to sin and reject him, they became more and more guilty. And they came under more and more condemnation from God because of their actions. And think about this. These religious leaders, they had all of the accumulated revelation of the Old Testament. And for three years, they had the Son of God living in their midst, proclaiming God's truth and light to them. You could argue that they had more revelation than any other generation, and they chose to reject it all. And as a result, all of the righteous blood of the earth was placed upon them. And you'll notice in the second half of verse 35, Jesus gives a decisive overview of how from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, God's people had murdered the messengers he sent. You'll recall all the way back in Genesis chapter 4 that Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions as an offering to God But Cain did not bring the first fruits of the ground. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 4 that the Lord accepted Abel's offering. But he did not accept Cain's offering. And as a result, Cain was so full of anger that the Bible says that he rose up against his brother and he killed him. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 24, verses 20 to 21, we find the account of a man named Zechariah. He was the son of Jehoiada, and he was stoned to death by King Joash in the court of the house of the Lord. And many scholars believe that this is the Zechariah that Jesus is referring to. But I'll remind you that this morning that there is approximately 20 different Zacharias mentioned in Scripture. And I don't think the Zechariah in 2 Chronicles 24 is the Zechariah that Jesus is referring to. I think it is the prophet Zechariah uh, who authored the book of Zechariah because in Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible says that this is Zechariah whose father's name is was Barakiah. And I think it fits in the context of what Jesus is trying to say to these religious leaders by way of condemnation. Jesus is saying, 
Look at the text and don't miss it. From Abel to Zechariah, these religious leaders and the Jewish people were guilty of this blood. They had killed the people God sent to them from A to Z. From the beginning of the Old Testament to the end of the Old Testament, they had murdered and killed God's prophets because they did not want to be ruled by God. And in Jesus' day, they continued this rebellion by crucifying him and, as Jesus prophesied, killing and crucifying those he sent to them. Finally, you'll notice in verse 36 that Jesus emphasizes the cumulative effect of their actions. Look at how he summarizes it, stating that all these things will come upon this generation. All what things? All of the guilt, all of the judgment that unbelieving mankind has been accumulating since the fall was coming to a climax in the lives of these religious leaders. And it was going to rain down upon them in judgment. Jesus says, in this generation. And if you'll recall in our study of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus loves this phrase, this generation. He has used it repeatedly in Matthew chapter 11, in Matthew chapter 12, in Matthew chapter 17, and now here in Matthew chapter 23. The judgment that God is bringing upon this generation, Jesus says, will no longer be delayed. It would be this generation, the nation of Israel, who would experience the total destruction of Jerusalem and the temple just 40 years from this prophetic statement that Jesus gives. A time, as Luke describes, as the days of vengeance upon Jerusalem. And since A.D. 70, for 2,000 years, friends, the Jews have endured persecution after persecution, they have been maligned, falsely accused, treated unjustly, denied dignity, driven out of countries, massacred without mercy. And it's all a result of these words from Jesus. And as one author noted, the divine preservation of the Jews is not only for God's purpose of ultimately redeeming his chosen people, but it is also a perpetuation of their punishment. It is a continuing chastening that will endure until, as Jesus says in this text, they cry out in faith, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is Christ's condemnation. Now, J.C. Ryle observed that just as Jesus did not cast aside the religious leaders and the people of his day without calling them to repentance and faith through his teaching and by sending to them messengers, in the same way God deals with us today. And he writes, God does not cut them off in their sins without a call to repentance. He knocks at the door of their hearts by sicknesses and afflictions. He assails their consciences by sermons or by the advice of friends. He summons them to consider their ways by opening the grave under their eyes and taking away from them their idols. They often know not what it all means. They are often blind and deaf to all his gracious messages, but they will see his hand at last, though perhaps too late. They will discover that they too, like the Jews, had prophets and wise men and scribes sent to them. Now you may be an unbeliever in this room. A person who has never recognized their sin and has never recognized that their sin has separated them from the God who created them. 
And they've never turned from their sin and trusted and believed in Christ for their salvation and reconciliation to God. You may be an unbeliever this morning. And I ask you today, unbeliever, do you realize that God has given you opportunity after opportunity to confess your sins, to turn from your sins, and to trust in His Son? Do you realize that just like the scribes and the Pharisees of Jesus' day, all of these opportunities that God has given you by His grace and your failure to respond to them only increase your accountability and guilt before God? That your continual rejection of Christ, your continual refusal to turn from your sin and to turn to Christ heaps upon you more and more judgment from God. Would you not hear the invitation that Jesus tried to give to the scribes and the Pharisees before it's too late? And would you not turn to Christ today and escape His condemnation? We not only see Christ's condemnation, in verses 37 and 38 we see Christ's compassion. And this is what Jesus went on to say, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. Now in verse 37, Jesus makes another transition, and he turns his attention from the scribes and the Pharisees. Notice it. To Jerusalem. And in these verses, Jesus' words are full of passion. They're full of tenderness. And they're full of sadness. The words of Jesus in verse 37 are actually a lament. He is lamenting over the state of Israel. Luke, in his account, says that as Jesus had entered Jerusalem the morning before this day, he wept over it. And this is what Luke records in Luke chapter 19, verses 41 to 44. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And notice what Luke records. Jesus wept over the condition of Israel. The prophet Jeremiah expressed a similar grief when he considered the prospects of Judah being taken captive by Babylon. And this is what he recorded in Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 17. But if you will not listen, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. And my eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears because the Lord's flock has been taken captive. And in verse 37, like the prophet Jeremiah, Jesus is grieved over the hardness of the hearts of his people. And with passion, and with an element of rebuke, he cried out, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, much in the same way that he said in Luke 10, 41, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Or when he said in Luke 22, 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. Or in Acts chapter 9 and verse 4 when he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Words of passion and words of rebuke. And using the city of Jerusalem as a representative of all of Israel, Jesus reminds the people of their rebellion and rejection of him by killing the prophets and the wise men and the scribes that he sent to them. You'll notice in verse 37, he uses the words kills and stones. 
They're active, present participles. And it could literally be translated, who are killing, who are stoning, indicating that they're never going to stop their persecution of God's messengers. That unbelieving Israel had been killing the righteous prophets of God from Abel to Zechariah. They would soon kill God's one and only son. And in the future, they would kill the prophets and the wise men and the scribes that were sent to them. They would never stop doing this. And in his lament, Jesus declared, look at the text, that he longed, he longed to gather Israel to himself and to protect them from judgment just as a hen gathers her brood under its wings to protect them from a storm or from predators that would devour them. And can't you hear the compassion in Jesus' words in this text? He's just spoken words of prophetic condemnation Upon them that judgment was coming upon them. And now with passion and compassion and sadness in his heart. Oh Jerusalem. Oh Jerusalem. How I've longed to spread my wings and gather you under them and protect you. And be a refuge and strength for you. Against the judgment that is to come. He's mourning over the state of his people. He had come to them, as John 1.11 says, to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Throughout his time on earth, Jesus repeatedly invited the people of his day to come to him and to find rest And to find refuge. And to find forgiveness. And to find healing under his wings. With the ultimate invitation given in Matthew chapter 11. Verses 28 and 29. Come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Over and over. He gave this invitation. And in the midst of his words of passion and compassion and sadness, notice his commentary to them. Don't miss it. He offered all of these invitations. And what does he say? They were not willing. They would not come. They did not want to come. They refused to come. God was willing and they were not. Friends, this text is the height of the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. And I found J.C. Ryle so helpful in his words on this text. He says, let us understand that the ruin of those who are lost is not because Christ was not willing to save them, nor yet because they wanted to be saved but could not, but because they would not come to Christ. Let the ground we take up be always that of the passage we are now considering. Christ would gather men, but they would not be gathered. Christ would save men, but they would not be saved. Let it be a settled principle in our religion that men's salvation, if saved, is holy of God. And that man's ruin, is lo- if lost, is holy of himself. Listen, that evil that is in us is all our own. And the good, if we have any, is all of God. The saved in the next world will give God all the glory. And the lost in the next world will find that they have destroyed themselves because of their rejection of Christ. Friends, when a person rejects Christ, it is never God's fault. It is theirs. They are responsible for rejecting Christ. God is sovereign 
And man is completely and utterly responsible. And Jesus makes that abundantly clear. Now notice what happens in verse 38. After grieving over Jerusalem, Jesus makes a bold declaration. And he says to them, see, your house is left to you desolate. And with these words, Jesus is saying that Israel would be destroyed. And we find the theological background for this judgment in 1 Kings chapter 9, verses 6 through 9, where the Bible says, But if you turn aside from following me, you or your children, and do not keep my commandments and my statutes that I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land that I have given them, and the house that I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight, and Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all peoples, and this house will become a heap of ruins, and everyone passing by it will be astonished and will hiss, and they will say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will say, because they abandoned the Lord their God who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, the Lord has brought all of this disaster on them. Now notice what happens in the text in verse 38. Jesus no longer calls the temple his father's house like he did in Matthew chapter 21. Look at what he says. He refers to it as their house. Now, why did he do that? Because the temple is the symbol of God's relationship with his people. And Jesus is now saying that this relationship is broken. That judgment is coming. And so, the temple has been abandoned by God. And it's been left to the people in judgment. And notice what he says about it. Because they had forsaken God's commandments, because they had forsaken God's son, God will now render them desolate. They will be despised. They will be persecuted. They will be afflicted. And it will reach its climax in the great tribulation. So how are we to think about this for our lives? Well, if you're a believer this morning, I want to ask you if you're quick to pronounce woe and wrath on sinners before you ever weep for them. You see in the text, don't you, believer, that Christ wept for the unwilling. Do you? Do you weep? For the unwilling? Do you weep for the state of any one soul? We are taught as believers to share Christ's compassion and longing for the salvation of others. We are to weep for them, be burdened by them. And I ask you this morning, if you're a believer, if you would just pause for a moment in the midst of this sermon and think about how many people there are around you or in the sphere of your life whose homes are left desolate just as Jesus is talking about in this passage. How many people do you know? How many people are you surrounded by who are living a pain-filled, empty life void of the presence and the blessing of God? And then I ask you, believer. Are you quick to pronounce God's judgment upon them before you ever weep for the condition of their soul? Oh, it's easy to pronounce the judgment. It's much more difficult and personal to weep and pray and lament over the condition of a soul. As one commentator stated, how sad if we rejoice in what we know of God's salvation and simply ignore those who are truly lost and bound for hell. How sad if we rejoice in what we've been given by God and give no thought to those who have never experienced such grace. 
do you have compassion for the lost? Do you have compassion for those family members who irritate the life out of you? And have you forgotten that they act that way because that's the way lost people act? And have you forgotten that you used to be just like that? And that the only difference between you and them is that you've tasted of the grace of God. And he's changed your life. And dear friend, can I just remind you that if he could change you, he could change them. Weeping over the lost. Unbeliever, would you hear the patient and merciful pleas of Jesus? He's given you his word. He's given you his church. He's given you servants to hear his message and his invitation proclaimed. He's given you the opportunity to come under the shelter of his wings and experience salvation and forgiveness and rest and a future and a hope. And all of this is possible, unbeliever, if you will come to him. And why wouldn't you do that this very moment? Why wouldn't you, seated right where you are before this sermon ends, cry out to Jesus with your heart and soul and ask Him to forgive you and save you? Why wouldn't you do that? Why would you wait another second? That's how real this text is, friends. It's about eternity. It's about heaven and hell. It's about forever. And you would play with that and reject that. We see Christ's condemnation. We see his compassion. And finally, in verse 39, we see his coronation. He says, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes In the name of the Lord. Now notice how he begins verse 39. I tell you. It points to a new situation that is beginning. It points to an eschatological change. It is a, I told you this passage is a transition passage. It moves us from everything that we've studied in Matthew's gospel into chapter 24 in the prophetic section of the gospel where Jesus teaches about end time events. And in verse 39, he is making that transition into chapter 24. And he's saying to them with this phrase, I tell you that I am leaving public Jewish life. And the next time you see me, it's going to be very different. And notice, these are the final words of Jesus that he gives in a public address. And with the strongest of all possible language, Jesus announces that he's leaving Jerusalem and that the city and the temple will be destroyed before he reappears again. And then... He echoes the words of Psalm 118 and verse 26. The very words that were shouted at Jesus just a few days earlier when he entered Jerusalem on a donkey in Matthew chapter 21. And all of the Jews would have recognized these words that Jesus quotes from Psalm 118 in verse 39. They associated these words with the Messiah and with the establishment of his kingdom. But because Jesus was not the Messiah they wanted, and because Jesus didn't come and overthrow the Roman government like they wanted, Israel's shouts of coronation turned into shouts of crucifixion. And Jesus says, once you kill me, you'll not see me again until you say once more and mean it. Blessed is he who comes In the name of the Lord. And notice in verse 39 what it says. It'll be like this until you utter those words. It's a hopeful statement. He's pronounced judgment and condemnation upon them. 
But he's telling them there's coming a day when the judgment will end and the coronation will begin. And in the very next chapter, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus describes what that's going to look like. And in verses 29 to 31, this is what he says about that time. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus says, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This is what Jesus is proclaiming. His coronation and ultimate reconciliation with his people. My friends, Matthew wrote chapter 23 so that the church would listen afresh to the woes and the warnings that Jesus gives so that we might see Jesus for who he really is. The soon coming king and the judge of all the world. And every single one of us are going to stand and give an account of our lives to him on that day. Do you see Jesus like that? He's showing you himself. So you won't be surprised on that day. And yet, Jesus proclaims with his own voice that on that day, there will be some who stand before him shocked. He says it in Matthew 7. He says there'll be some who stand before him and appear before him on that day. And they'll say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these things in your name? And he will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. They will be astonished. He's shown you himself. So you will not be astonished on that day. Jesus' final public message was a reminder of the stark contrast between the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. And in his final sermon, Jesus reminds us that every single one of us will stand before him entirely responsible for our response to the truth that we have been given. The question is, will you and I reject him like the generation of his day, and like the generation of our day? Or will you turn to him and find shelter under his wings for the judgment that is soon coming upon the world? This was a message for the generation of Jesus' day. And friends, please don't miss this. It is a message for our generation. Jesus is coming back. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for these sobering reminders. And I pray, God, that you would help us to live under the reality of this text. That those of us who know you would have a burden for those who don't. And that those who don't know you would come to know you through Christ. And so we pray that you would take your word today and bring it to bear on the lives of your people for your glory and for the building of your church. We thank you for this time to sit under your word and for your spirit being our teacher and our guide today. 
And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.